my name is Ray Stewart, but that's unimportant. The important thing is what you're about to see and hear. During the next hour, you will be privileged to view scenes never before photographed for television and to hear an analysis of their importance in the training and development of a Roman Catholic nun. This is an exercise in understanding and enlightenment. Many people consider nuns a baffling anachronism. They seem to be a flock misplaced from the Middle Ages and should be as extinct as the gladiators, but who are very much alive and seem to be getting considerable fun out of it. They are teachers and nurses, missionaries and social workers. But you know much of the work they do. This program concerns why they do it, why they shut themselves up in a convent, why they shun worldly goals and ambitions, why they choose to be poor, chaste, and obedient. Because there are more than 500 Catholic sisterhoods in the United States alone, it is necessary to make a selection. The religious community of the Sisters of the Third Order of St. Francis of the Diocese of Pittsburgh was chosen. The mother house of these Franciscan sisters is at Mount Alvernia, Millville, Pennsylvania. Specifically, we shall be interested in a girl called Joan. We begin our story with Joan in the eighth grade. She attends parochial school and is familiar with the teaching nuns and their work. One day, as she listens to Sister Juanita discuss her vocation, Joan begins to sing. I never thought the harvest was so great and the laborers so few. I wonder if I could do something. I think I would like to give my life helping to save souls. Sure, that's just what I will do. I'll give my life to you, God. As soon as I have finished the eighth grade, I'll join the prep school. But what will Mom say and Dad? I don't even know how to tell them. How on earth am I going to tell her? I do hope she understands. Gee, I'm really scared. But I have to say something before, before I lose courage. Mom, I want to be a sister. I want to join a prep school, and I'll have to leave this September. What I mean is, I want to enter the convent, all right? Oh, what a relief. She's smiling. Well, dear God, that's one done. But there is still one to go. Please do that Dad understand as Mom did. Dad? Mom said I could enter the convent, and it's all right if I join the prep school in September. That is, if, if it's okay with you. Oh, why was I so scared to ask you? You're so wonderful. Of course, my parents understand that nuns aren't odd people. They're just normal people living dedicated lives. The Sisters of St. Francis operate a preparatory school in connection with their mother house and novitiate at Mount Alvernia. To all practical purposes, it is a boarding school, offering an accredited four-year high school curriculum. Along with 80 other girls who plan eventually to become nuns, Prep girl follows a routine of classes and study very little different from that of other high school girls. A well-rounded, basic education is important to her life in the religious community, so she follows the normal life of a teenage girl in a boarding school, the main difference being her ultimate purpose in life. The prep girl studies during the normal school year and goes home for holidays and summer vacation. As she prepares her mind, she is given every opportunity to compare the religious life with life back home. Speaking to you from the library of the high school, Mount Alvernia High School, I'd like for you to meet one of the prep girls, Mary Jo Campus. Uh, Mary Jo, what class are you in? I'm a senior. And where are you from? I'm from the Nesson, Pennsylvania. Now, as a senior, uh, you're about to embark upon what we're going to show in the rest of this film. Do you plan to enter the... Uh, what prompted you to do this? Well, I guess we want to know what actually prompted me to come to the press in the first place. Yeah. But I had been taught by the sisters of this, uh, this community in grade school. And the work that they did impressed me, the fact that they had so much of an opportunity to form young minds. And also the sisters themselves impressed me. They had a sense of joy. It seemed as if I could, that I could find no other people. And it seemed as though there was so much work to be done, and not enough people to do it. But I think that's what prompted me to come. Well, what type of course are you taking? What are you preparing for so far? I'm taking the academic course to prepare me for college and teaching. Perhaps. Teaching is what you would like to do. Uh, this 
this is uh, largely a teaching order too, isn't it? I mean, many teachers. And they're women mostly women. teachers, but they're also nurses. And uh, you have seen the things here since you've been here that keep you wanting to uh, continue on your path. Oh yes, sir. We have much of an opportunity to observe the teachers and to see how they live, and to do some of it ourselves. Some of those practices are introduced to us at the prep, and most of them and very favorable when I'm very pleased and edified. Well, now, we've been talking about your inspiration, and we've been talking about your study, and I'm sure that uh, there must be the fun side of all of this, too. Oh, there? yes, Mr. Stewart. Some of the prep's favorite moments are those she spends having fun with her sister prep. Friendly competition within the group provides a good time for all. Everyone likes to get into the act when it comes time for skating. Good luck and happy landing, prep. There's softball for the athletic, or lively music and singing for those who prefer this form of fun. And, of course, what teenager doesn't enjoy dancing? Matching wits in a game of cards often proves to be an occasion for advice from spectators. In all recreations, we enjoy being together, sharing our fun, knowing that time off leaves us better equipped for learning how to do God's work. Aside from services and prayers in the convent chapel, there are regular opportunities for religious expression. First of all, a nun is a good Christian. So the devotional life of those aspiring to be nuns is a vital part of their routine. They have declared their hope of becoming brides of Christ and must live personal lives worthy of that hope. Counseling is all important here and accounts for the major differences between this preparatory school and an ordinary boarding school. The decision to join a religious community is no step to be taken lightly. All the girls' questions must be answered. Doubts or fears must be examined. If at any time the girl changes her mind, she is free to leave. Likewise, if the sisters find her unsuitable for any reason, she will go back home. In the 11 years before she becomes a fully professed sister, she will be given every opportunity to reevaluate her decision and will be regularly examined to determine her continued suitability for the chosen life. Here, too, the example and spirit shown by the sisters themselves influence the girl's decision. Good appetites, radiant health, and a zest for living are qualities which abound in the normal teenage girl. Here she learns how to couple that with group living. Life is not all fun, and school is not all academic endeavor. If Joan and Susan and Carol and Ruth are to accept the strict discipline of a convent, they must learn obedience and cheerful application to the most menial tasks. This, of course, is still a part of everyday life, for these are things which must be done wherever people live. The acceptance of responsibility, the persistence to see a task through to completion, it's all based on good, sound character-building principles. Foundations laid here would make them better people inside a convent or out. With their goal constantly in mind, they work diligently. It doesn't take long for the new girls to get that feeling of belonging, and soon they're eagerly contributing to the prep newspaper, the staff of which is shown here. This is just one of the many group activities. Freshmen at the prep school are installed in the True Blue Club. The purpose and function of this organization closely parallels that of a student council in a regular high school. The officers of this school-wide group are leaders and organizers of many worthwhile student activities and events. The high purpose of the True Blue Club is the same high purpose of the prep girl herself and is expressed in their themes. Summer approaches, vacation packing begins. Graduating seniors pack for the last time. These graduating seniors are faced with the next major step in becoming a nun. They must request admission to the novitiate and begin their training in the convent. Upon graduation, Joan made this move. Joan made an appointment with the mistress of novices and went in for her interview, not without apprehension. 
I might add. I really hate to see my fifth day's end, yet I feel a thrill of joy at the thought of coming one step closer to my goal, for I now find myself asking admission as a postulant. When I think of it, I know it won't be an easy life, but then, when a young girl marries, all unpleasant things become a joy because she does them for the man she loves. So too shall I find great joy in working for souls, because I too will be working out of love, the love of God. The day has arrived for her entrance to the novitiate. With all doubts behind her, Joan is ready. A few formalities and she will be in. Mother and Dad are here today. There are questions to answer and forms to fill out, papers to sign and agreements to be made. Parents must grant written permission for girls under 21 to enter this religious life. They must also agree that she may return home if she or the sisters decide it is best. The candidate herself must sign a statement that she takes this step of her own free will. Formalities over, Joan comes ever closer to life as a postulant. The postulant is one who seeks admission. Joan will be a postulant for one year. Things move fast on this exciting day. Now Joan must put away her pretty dresses, begin to wear black clothes and pencils. As a postulant, she will not wear the same habit as a nun, but the severe styling will represent an abrupt change in personal appearance. From this day forth, her dress will set her apart from the world. Since setting apart is what Joan seeks, she greets each new step with enthusiasm. Dressed in her new clothes, the final step in acceptance as a postulant is her appearance before the superior to receive the small postulant's faith. In response to the question, what do you seek, my child, Joan says, I humbly beg to be accepted as a candidate for membership in the third order regular of the Sisters of St. Francis. As evidence of her approval, the superior places the posthumous veil upon Joan's head. As she leaves the room, Joan embarks upon a new life as an aspirant to the rule of St. She rushes back to the waiting room where her mother and dad see her for the first time in her new life. Goodbyes are said in the midst of laughter and tears. The superior joins the group to greet the parents and to assure them in words uttered long ago that the daughter they give to God is the daughter they will always have. Not all parents are pleased about having their child enter a convent, but the tears of Joan's parents are tears of joy. They are proud of her and proud of her decision. And so they parted the door of the convent. Mother and Dad know that Joan is happy and that she will successfully make adjustments to convent life. They eagerly await the first visiting day, one month away. I certainly feel different. It seems so strange that I'll never wear this yellow dress again, and I'll be wearing black for the rest of my life. Yet, somehow, deep in my heart, I feel joy, the joy of giving for Christ, and I wouldn't trade it for 50 yellow dresses. I'm speaking to you from the room known as the postulate here in the convent, and I would like for you to meet at this time a postulant whose name is Carol Vandervoort. And Carol, we've seen how you received your veil and so forth, but uh, tell me in your words, what is a postulant? Well, a foster baby is a girl who enters the convent with the idea that she wants to become a teacher or a nurse and testify in the work of the community. And uh, she, she remains a foster for a year. She's one who's seeking admission. And uh, during this year, she prepares for her novice work, which usually is a year afterwards. And during that time, she takes regular classes and she spends her time here at the mother house. Can you tell me why you decided to become a sister? Well, I think the reason I, well, I've always wanted to be a sister, I think, but uh, the reason why I decided on this order was that I always admired the spirit of the sisters, particularly when I was in high school, and uh, I was taught by our sisters, it was right here at Mount Alvernia, and um, I really did admire the spirit. They were very friendly, and they really practiced things to enjoy. And how long can you remember wanting to be a nun? Well, I think since about the third grade, when I was first taught by the sisters, I really, I really admired them. And I think that's where I really first got my idea. Were you a prep girl? 
Oh, yes. I was a prep for four years. I went to high school right here. Well, tell me, uh, we, you're here and uh, you're realizing your ambition. Uh, it must have been some adjustment when you first came to the convent. Oh, yes. It was quite an ordeal, I think. I'll never forget the first day we came. And uh, when Sister showed us to the dormitory, and I can remember exactly what I thought. This is where I'll be spending my nights from now on. Hmm. Nothing but hard back here. Plain nightstand. Certainly is fair looking and quite different from what I left behind. Much neater, though. And everything is so simple and spotlessly clean. And so I am shown to my little section of the dormitory. Well, I'm here now, and I'm determined to give this life a fair try. I start by unpacking all my things. It seems an appropriate way to begin. I honestly can't get over how simple everything is. Not one elaborate article in the entire room, yet everything necessary is here. But how could I have thought otherwise? After all, didn't Christ himself promise us a hundredfold in this life and immeasurable happiness in the next? My crucifix, that goes right here on my pillow. It makes me think of how little I'm really giving up in comparison with what he did for me. What's that? I didn't notice that before. Well, just draw the curtain and I have all the privacy I want. That seems easy enough. Without leaving the convent, the postulants can register for college classes which will lead them to a degree at either Duquesne University or Mount Mercy College. Liberal arts and pre-professional courses are taught. English, foreign languages, biology, psychology. There are lectures and assignments, research and study. If she is to go out and help others, she herself must be well prepared. At the same time she is studying and getting adjusted to the routine, she is observing and being she has taken no vows, made no promises. She is free to leave at any time. Most any professed sister will tell you that her happiest days were spent as a postulant. But for all their lightheartedness, there is solid piety beneath that flimsy black veil. Much of the fun, perhaps, comes from relief. Her previous ideas of the convent have been smashed. She's in now, and she knows. She knows there is much to learn about the serious side of life. She learns that her heart and soul must be developed, that she must expand her life so as to embrace all of the humanity in her loving and in her thinking. Her spiritual life is a vital part of her development. Private prayers and meditation will take an increasing amount of her time. Meditation is an effort for those whose mind has run at liberty for many years. And she comes from an environment where the accent has been on doing into the convent where the accent is on the field. Silence is a daily penance she must learn. At meals, she will eat in silence while someone reads aloud. Her physical needs are taken care of. Her food is adequate and nourishing, but all the thrills are gone. She must learn common living and give up much of her pride. She must observe many rules all designed to bring out the best there is within her. The rule of St. Francis was tried and found practical centuries ago. For instance, the table at which she sits is bare, and is symbolic of the lack of finery she must sacrifice in her new life. Time moves swiftly, and soon the year of postulancy has passed. Canon law requires that the bishop or his delegate interview each postulant least a month before being admitted as a member. He is to determine if she understands her purpose and if she is doing it of her own free will. If all things are satisfactory, if she is accepted by her superiors and still wants to remain, she takes the next great step in her vocational development. Dressed as a bride, she joins the others in procession to the chapel where she will be invested in the habit of a novice the Order of the Sisters of St. Francis. Thank you. 
During a portion of the ceremony, she accepts from the then Monsignor, now Bishop Tenair, a lighted candle, symbolic of the purity of life she must lead and the burning love she must have in her heart for all mankind. This moment holds deep spiritual significance. Earlier in the ceremony, upon interrogation, she has declared that she seeks the holy habit of religion and has the firm intention to persevere in religion to the end of her life. already I'm being invested. With the acceptance of the holy habit, I'll be looked upon as a spouse of Christ, a faithful, loving soul, ready to give my all for his greater honor and glory. I realize, though, that a religious habit does not mean a miraculous transformation. Rather, it will mean a hard, continual struggle with myself and with other temptations if I want to persevere in my ideal. The future may even hold difficulties in suffering, but all this can become a joy and bring peace if it's done for love. His guiding hand has led me to take this step, and if I'm willing, I know he'll lead me all the way. To emphasize to herself and those who witness this vestition ceremony, the bride prostrates herself before the altar and is covered with what is called a death cloth. This is symbolic of what takes place in the heart of the camp. She wishes to die to the world and live for God. Before she garbs herself in the religious habit, she witnesses the blessing of each part. This she will always remember. She will always regard her habit as something sacred. It's a symbol of all that is deepest in her life, her consecration to God. As the priest intones, may the Lord divest thee of the old man and his deeds, and root out of thy heart those worldly pumps which thou didst renounce at thy baptism, Joan sacrifices that which is every girl's pride, a beautiful pair. The priest presents the religious habit he has blessed, saying, May the Lord clothe thee in the garb of salvation and circle thee round about with the vesture of justice. He hands her the veil, saying, Receive the white veil, the emblem of inward purity. With the cord he says, May the Lord gird thee with the girdle of this order. Take this blessed rosary and wear it as a perpetual remembrance that thou hast thy greatest treasure in a frail face. With the crucifix, he says, receive the cross of the Lord that it may be a sign of salvation to thee. Clothed in the habit of a novice in the order of the Sisters of St. Francis, she receives her name in religion. Like any other bride, she starts her new life with a new name. Joan will no longer be known as Joan, but will take the name of Sister Madonna. Sister Madonna is another step closer to her goal, life of service to God and to men. So she embarks upon the most important year of the formation period, the canonical year. 
she will be thoroughly grounded in the vows of religion. Each vow will be carefully examined so she will know what is required by the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. She will study the life of St. Francis and try to imitate him in his great love for all men. She is becoming a friend of Christ. We are moving about the convent here, and the moment we're speaking to you from the Angie Chapel, outside the main chapel here at Mount Alvernia, and I'd like for you to meet Sister Claver. Sister Claver is Mistress of Novices, and uh, perhaps you can tell us what the Mistress of Novices does, what is your position? Well, I suppose the best way that I can answer that is to state my office as it is stated in our Constitution which says that the work of the mistress of novices is to form the novices. Now, a novice is one who is training to become a sister of St. Francis. Of course, it's a novice in every order, not only in the sister of St. Francis. And uh, this takes how long, I mean, as a novice? As what we call a white novice, it takes one year and uh, this is called, I think, the canonical year. Isn't that That's right. And it's called the canonical year because that is required of every novice in every community that they remain one year according to canon law. This is a pretty strict year, isn't it, uh, for them? It's a very strict year. And the purpose of that is so that they can learn very definitely the principles of the religious life without too much interference from the outside world. Mm -hmm. And it gives them the, the real, true feeling, I guess you might say, of life in a convent. A little different from the posture. Oh, it, yes. In fact, they really begin to live the rule and the constitution of the order. They learn all about it. They learn what is required of them in their uh, vows and in the rule. And they just uh, live the life so that they will know whether or not that is the life that they really want to live. Mm -hmm. This is, this is a real probation period, then, a if you will. A very probational period. That's right. They're taking no vows. No, absolutely not. They're only finding out whether they want to live the vows or not. And as Mistress of Knowledge, what is your role? I mean, how do you go about this formation yourself? Well, uh, first of all, the novice really has to form herself. I'm only really an auxiliary helper, and so my assistant also helps me along with this work. Because each individual is an individual, and because each one's spiritual life is developed individually, the greater part of the work is done by counseling and interviewing. They are very self-critical, I think. Oh, yes. They try to find out what we call their predominant fault. We tell them, uh, find, learn yourself, accept yourself, and then do something about yourself. And uh, aside from the personal aspects, and you have a great deal of uh, religious instruction in the order and in the, what, the way they're expected to live. That's right. Uh, we, ex uh, we explain the rules, the constitution, and the vows, uh, that they have to live them according to our constitution. Mr. Claver, this is such a vital part of the formation of the nun. Could you tell me uh, now, as we look at films made, just what goes on during this canonical year. Instruction begins immediately to the novice on the primary purpose of the nun's life. If she is introduced to the physical development which she is expected to achieve in herself, firstly, to end of sainthood, secondly, to develop her God-given talent, and thirdly, to increase her appreciation of the fine arts, all in preparation for a life of service to others for the love of God. The sister is expected to develop into a woman who is saintly, a woman who is intellectual, and a woman who is cultured. 
The learning of the art of prayer forms a major part of the instructional program of the novel. These instructions aim at helping her to become saintly. The virtues of kindness, cheerfulness, sympathy, and generosity toward others, of which her future work will be a constant exercise, find cultivation during the many hours she spends in prayer. Frequent meditation on the teachings of Christ nurtures in her heart the desire of imitating the virtues of Christ. The many devotional pictures and statues which are found in Cloister Hall help the novice to develop the habit of praying always, a practice which Christ himself recommends. At certain times during the day, groups of nuns, when passing from one part of the house to another, join together in prayer. The outdoors also provide atmosphere for developing the woman of prayer. Skies, trees, and fresh air are most conducive to the cultivation of the habit of raising the heart and the mind to God in acts of adoration, thanksgiving, reparation, and petition. Prayerful thinking about those of the order who lived holy lives and who now rest in the beautiful Condon Cemetery gives added reasons to the novice for developing in her own self a true spirit of close union with God in prayer. The neighboring hills and distant views help expand the heart, the mind, and the soul of the novice, who is preparing herself to love the whole world. The forgetfulness of self in the thought of what she is hoping to do for others urges her on day after day. The spirit of prayer is not lost, even during the time spent in manual work. And there are all kinds of manual tasks for the nuns. Cooking, washing, ironing, and scrubbing. Every young nun participates in such tasks regardless of the kind of profession for which she is being prepared. These tasks are usually performed in silence to give all the opportunity for advancing in the skill of continuous prayer. And since most of the manual work she does is service toward others, the nun also grows in the virtues of love of neighbor as she goes about the work of helping to prepare meals, cleaning the house, and countless other tasks for her sister religious. She is learning to give willingly service to others. Some young women show a preference for this kind of work. If superiors approve, these sisters may devote their entire lives to domestic work. Only a small portion of the day is spent in manual work. The greater part is spent in intellectual development. The sister students are given adequate preparation for the teaching and the nursing profession. A full college program is part of this professional preparation. Classroom instruction, assignments, research, wide and intensive reading provide the means for the intellectual growth of the prospective teacher or nurse. In the first year of formation, these studies usually comprise English, history, language, philosophy, and theology. During the canonical or novice year, intellectual activities are usually restricted to theology, philosophy, and sacred music. The reason being that these studies are most closely related to the intensive spiritual development which is expected to take place during this one year. The remaining three years of preparation are devoted to a continuation of this liberal education, but with the addition of professional subjects such as psychology, speech, methodology, and other allied subjects. Regardless of the professional concentration of the sister, she is expected to participate in all the cultural activities offered, and they are many. Through music and art appreciation programs, she develops a deep appreciation of beauty and truth. Interpretation of musical selections helps to lay a basis for a common understanding of other people's interests and accomplishments. 
thus opening up the way to a real appreciation of the cultures of all peoples. Informal group discussions of great books and masterpieces of art open up the mind of future teachers and nurses to that interesting world of people, striving to find truth and surround that truth with beauty. We are in the novitiate now here at the convent, and the sisters that you see with the white veils are novices, and here is a novice that I think we want to talk to for a few minutes. What is your name? Sister Margaret Rose. Well, Sister Margaret Rose, uh, what is a novice? Well, Mrs. Stewart, a novice is a young woman who is preparing to become a sister. And you haven't taken your vows yet, as I understand it. No, sir. We take our baths at the end of our novice year. And at this particular moment, how long have you been a novice? For about seven and a half months. And uh, you were a postulant before that. We have seen what a postulant does. Were you a prep girl? No, sir. I went to Mount Alvernia High School as a day student. And where are you from? From St. Scholastica Parish in Aspen. And uh, tell me about, uh, is this life measuring up to what you expected it would? Well, when we were invested, Mr. Stewart, I expected that it would be quite different from life in the world. And since we are preparing to become sisters, we actually live the life of a sister as a novice. We live as though we were under the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And we do all the spiritual exercises and all the things which professed members of the community do. And in this way, when I was invested, I knew what I was getting into, and uh, it has been just what I expected. Do you like the life? Very much. You are under very strict discipline now, aren't you? Yes, sir. We don't see our relatives or friends more than a few times a year because canon law says that novices have to be cloistered. Well, now, this far along, uh, are your intentions still to take your vows and become a sister as you planned? Yes, sir. You haven't changed your mind anyway. Yes. Well, uh, in the novitiate here, you uh, really live, uh, as we have said, a strict life, and that life is pretty well ordered by a routine and by bells. It seems like I hear bells around all the time. Yes, sir. I can still remember the first time I heard the big convent bell ring. I soon learned that it meant to stop or to begin something, and that all of life in the convent is regulated by bells. It has come to mean obedience to me. Bells call me to recreation. Recreation is an important part of religious life. Like St. Francis, I have found that nature is a playground in which I can become physically and intellectually refreshed. The real purpose of fun time in the convent is to refresh tired minds and bodies so that they can go back to God's work with new strength and vigor. I never thought before my entrance into the convent that nuns engaged in so many interesting relaxations, such as basketball, dodgeball, and other kinds of ball play. Skating is one of the favorites. None of us come away from these periods of fun and laughter without renewed energy for our intellectual and manual work. It is during times of preparation for a special entertainment, which often includes a dramatization, that I learn how much family spirit there can be in the convent. Working together with all the gives and takes offers many opportunities to practice cheerfulness with one another. St. Francis put it this way, What else are the servants of the Lord but his ministry? lifting up the hearts of men and moving them to special gladness. Yes, the hours of recreation have a real purpose in convent life. After completion of her canonical year, the novice is ready to take her temporary vows and receive her black veil. After approval and acceptance by her superiors in the order, and upon her determination that this is still what she wants, she prepares to take her vows in the ceremony of profession. This ceremony includes the celebration of the Mass. The religious life is necessarily linked with the idea of sacrifice. In the celebration of the Mass, 
sacrifice which Christ made of himself on Calvary is renewed. The central act of sacrifice is the consecration. It comprises two separate acts. First, the consecration of the host or body of Christ. The second part of this central act of sacrifice is the consecration of the blood of Christ as contained in the chalice. The novice kneels to recite her vows and receive Holy Communion. She vows to observe for three years the rule of the Third Order Regular of St. Francis, to live in obedience, in chastity, and in poverty. She then receives Holy Communion. Dear Jesus, I'm no longer a novice. What a beautiful year it was. How fast it passed. It didn't seem like 12 months at all. And my dear mistress, how much she tried to teach me and how much I tried to learn. Now if I can only remember all the advice and counsel that this so patient man so cheerfully given. How good it is to look forward to many years in your vineyard, working with souls and trying with your help to save them. Let me be like the sower in the gospel who scattered his seed on good soil so that it would bear much good fruit. Please do help me, won't you, Lord, to be worthy of this magnificent mission. Help me to realize that this school book is my guide. I promise to live according to it, and I wish only to do your will, and I believe that your will is made known to me through my rule and my security. I'm speaking to you now from the Magnificat study, and as the name will apply, why this is a room for work and study because they, although they are junior sisters now, they are still continuing their academic work. And here is one over here I want to sit down and uh, talk with for a moment. What is your name? Sister James Marie. Uh, Sister James Marie, where are you from? St. Wimpen's Church. And I indicated that you are a junior uh, sister. What does this mean? It means that we have already taken temporary vows. For how long? For three years, and then we'll renew them for two years, making a total of five years. And after temporary vows, you take uh, perpetual, perpetual vows. vows. Okay. Now, you had no vows. You were taking no vows while you were a novice. Mm -hmm. And uh, now you are living under vows. Is there any difference? Well, you don't feel any difference because the religious life isn't something of the feelings. It's something of the will. You will it. And as a novice, you just um, let a life, let's pretend you looked at the religious life and you said, I wonder if this is what I want. Well, um, on August the 13th, you said, this is what I want. And you pronounced your vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience and promised to live the rest of your life for God. And uh, you will renew your vows and then take your perpetual vows. You have no plans for changing. No, no plans for change. And what are you studying? Right now we're studying educational psychology and history and literature and um, introduction to teaching. Mm -hmm. And that means then that you're going to go out and teach whenever you're here. Yes, that's right, Mr. Stewart. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you find uh, life now that you are a nun with the black veil and so forth? Do you find it what you expected it to be? Yes, Mr. Stewart. We were never deceived in what the religious life was going to be. We were told that there'd be hard days, but... In every life, there's hard days, and you have to accept the little crosses. And when you learn to accept them for love, Christ's burden becomes light and his yoke free. Through the probationary period of temporary vows, study continues. This is Sister Madonna's third year in college, 
So in her tiny, barren room called a cell, she searches out the answer to a difficult problem. Her work is now more intensely related to the profession she will follow. In the formation of a nun such as Sister Madonna, emphasis is first placed on spiritual development. The profession she follows, the work she does, is the fruit of her dedicated life, not its purpose. What she has vowed must now be proven by her deeds. She is not formed of different clay than the rest of us. And she is not free of the normal needs and common weaknesses we feel in ourselves. She has set her eyes upon perfection and is willing to spend the major effort of her life striving to reach her goal. But she will not shut herself off from the needs of the world. So she works hard at preparing herself for service to others. The road is rough, but she is eager. The majority of the Sisters of St. Francis follow the profession of teaching, and so their college curriculum must prepare them to become accredited teachers. This means all the regular courses in education and practice teaching. Some will teach in elementary schools, some in secondary schools. It depends upon the need. After two years in the convent, first as postulant and then as novice, Sister Madonna lives the life bound by vows for the first time. By the vow of poverty, she has renounced ownership. She has vowed not to act as an owner, even in the materials she uses in her particular duty. By the vow of chastity, she renounced all the joys and pleasures of the married state. In the vow of obedience, she dedicated her free will to God by promising to follow the will of her superiors in the religious community. St. Francis of Assisi lived 700 years ago, and thousands continue to wear his habit and follow his rule. Imitation of the spirit and dedication of St. Francis is the ideal of the Franciscan sister. This is my third interview with Bishop Camille. I can hardly believe that the time has come for me to pronounce my final vow. However, I am very certain now that this is the way God wants me to fulfill my duty of loving him and my neighbor. Bishop, who represents the church, asks me if I am making this decision to remain in God's service for the rest of my life of my own free will, and if I think that I will be able to fulfill all its obligations. With a happy and a gracious heart, I answer, yes, Your Excellency, of my own free will, I desire to give myself to God forever through the vows of obedience, chastity, and poverty. And with the help of his grace, I hope to be able to do whatever he asks of me. The ceremony surrounding the taking of perpetual vows is the same as that for temporary vows. There is a candlelight procession, interrogation, holy communion, celebration of mass, and prostration. The difference being that a fully professed sister wears a wedding ring. The rings are blessed in the ceremony in the same manner and for the same purpose that the other parts of her habit were blessed. The priest sprinkles them with holy water and incense. Before celebration of the Mass, the sisters are interrogated concerning their intentions. Again, they are asked if they understand the vows they will take, if they understand the rules of the order and the obligations they are to assume. After the sisters have returned to their pews following interrogation, they advance singly to pronounce their vows. I, Sister Madonna, vow and promise Almighty God and Blessed Mary, Ever Virgin, our Blessed Father Francis, all the saints, and you, Reverend Mother, to observe for the whole time of my life the rule of the Third Order Regular of St. Francis, proved by Pope Pius XI, living in obedience, in chastity, and in poverty, according to the Constitution of the Tertiary Sisters of St. Francis of the Immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God. She then receives Holy Communion. Sister Madonna has reached one of her goals. She has taken her final vows and is a fully professed sister. As she receives her ring, she will hear the words she has longed to hear. I espouse thee to Jesus Christ, Son of the Father Most High, who may protect thee from all danger. Receive then the ring of faith, the 
seal of the Holy Ghost, that thou mayest be called the spouse of God. With those words echoing in her heart, Sister Madonna, the third order regular of the Sisters of St. Francis, stands on the threshold of a new life. She leaves the mother house that has been her home and example for five years and heads for her first assignment. At last, my grade school dreams come true, for I am now one more labor in God's great harvest. Not knowing just what lies ahead, I feel a bit of fear, but I guess everybody fears the unknown. One thing I'm sure of, and that is that God's work is waiting to be done, and as his bride, his work of teaching and healing the sick becomes my life. My work, and I'm out to do it. Gee, I have to smile when I think of the queer ideas some people have of mine. They think we bury ourselves in the convent because we failed in the world, or because our parents forced us in. I wonder if they believe that I'm here because I want to be here. The assignments to which Sister Madonna, or any sister, may go are varied. The Sisters of St. Francis operate three hospitals, and the work of the sisters there is vital. There is clerical work in accounting and a variety of other possible occupations. Their dedication to the welfare of others adds tenderness and compassion to their efforts. They tirelessly pursue heavy work schedules in the hospitals and in the schools where they teach. The sisters have four mission schools in San Juan, Puerto Rico, in addition to 35 schools in this area. I would like for you at this time to meet Mother Viola the Mother General of the Sisters of St. Francis. Mother Viola, I have one question for you, which is appropriate perhaps to this program. Uh, after we have seen all of this development and uh, these sisters are coming into the order, uh, why? Why is it not? Why is it not? is a very simple question, and it can be answered very simply. Everything that we have seen transpire here with these young folks has been de designed to prepare them for the works of the community. Uh, the works of the community uh, are uh, two main ones, the care of the sick and the education of the young. Now, these two works embrace an ideal that was set for us by the great St. Francis of Assisi. It was he who tried to include the entire world in his heart. And the great Gilbert Chesterton, who said that Francis died of a broken heart, trying to get the whole world into it. We try to imitate Francis in carrying out that ideal. In this imitation that you're talking about, this is what develops the personality of the various religious communities. I notice that there is a difference, and I might say I like the personality of the Sisters of St. Francis, but it's an imitation of St. Francis that accomplishes it. That's very correct. It's the imitation of Francis who went about trying to carry out that mandate of Christ, love one's neighbor. And so the works of our community are designed to serve mankind. Let me ask you one other question, and that is, why is a mother general? Why is a mother general? A mother general, of course, has a big job to do. But it isn't as big as it appears to be because of a very fine advisory staff that every mother general has. So I have two very competent sisters who have advised me on matters such as school administration, hospital administration, finance, every phase of community living. And so the work of a mother superior becomes uh, quite uh, simple when she has all of these advisors that you consult whenever a problem presents itself. Just a little technical question. Is there any difference between a mother superior and a mother general? Uh, no. Uh, the difference uh, is this. In some communities that have more than one province, then they have a mother superior for each province, a mother general for all the provinces. We do not have provinces. So in our community, a mother general and a mother superior are really synonymous terms. And about how many uh, sisters and how widespread are these that you must supervise? Uh, we have a, a little over 600. And uh, our work is done mostly in western Pennsylvania. We have a hospital in Georgia. We have foreign missions in Puerto Rico. And outside of that, our, our work is no further spread. And it takes a lot of sisters to do this work, doesn't it? It certainly does. And we have a lot of sisters who have come into the work 
doing a splendid job. I'm very proud of him. Thank you very much, my friend. Retirement comes at no specific age. One sister taught school until she was 83. Sister Gertrude at the piano is active at 96. It is difficult to guess the age of a nun. They appear to be active and hardy many years longer than the average person. Here at Mount Alvernia, they return for retirement to the same place they started as postulants and novices. Advanced age, chronic illness, or convalescence from serious illness brings the sisters here. In addition to the recreation you see, they spend much time in prayer and meditation. The sisters of the mother house call this group their powerhouse because of the spiritual support received from this quarter. Medical attention, of course, is important here. There is special diet, nursing care, and all the comforts of home for their retiring years. If I may be permitted a personal word at this point, it has been a unique pleasure for me and for us here at Channel 11 to bring you this interpretation of life and purpose in a Catholic sisterhood. It has been an enlightening and an uplifting experience. You've been hearing the Mount Alvernia Convent Choir in the background throughout the program. And now, in conclusion, we bring you a complete number by the choir. Thank you.